Well, welcome everyone. We're happy to see such a large turnout for our inaugural Community Conversations panel of winter term. Uh, tonight's topic is Facebook, and it's titled Face Off, Unmasking Facebook Community Formation and Social Networking. And uh, for those of you who are interested in helping plan future Hamilton Think Tank events, uh, the HTT group meets every Tuesday at 5 p.m. in the Collier Lounge, and so we're always looking for new ideas. We'd love to have you join us, drop in whenever you have an opportunity. Um, tonight's community conversation panel is a living learning initiative of Residence Life University Housing, and we're happy to be joined by a very astute and experienced panel that's going to raise some great questions tonight about Facebook, and so I'm going to introduce them briefly. Uh, Jeff Tan, who is an RA in Residence Life University Housing, he's also one of the leaders of HTT, is joining us this evening. Many of you know Jeff, I'm sure. Uh, Next to Jeff uh, is Professor Stephen Brintz, who I believe Jeff has had at least one course with here at the University of Oregon. And Professor Brintz is, uh, teaches both here in the philosophy department and also at Oregon State University. So we welcome Professor Brintz for joining us this evening. And Andrew Bonamici, who is an associate librarian for instructional services for university libraries. And he also has done some extensive research on Facebook. Andrew and his colleague, Annie Zeidman Karpinski, who is a science librarian, have assembled a wonderful bibliography for us this evening. We have some hard copies of that available over by the um, refreshments, if anybody's interested in taking that with them. Uh, the bibliography also has a URL address to the Community Conversations web space, where you can find this electronically. We also have a few interesting links that Andrew's provided us, one in particular that that we wanted to highlight uh, is a research study from the University of Georgia, or is it Georgia Tech. from Georgia Tech? And it's titled Crossing Boundaries, Identity Management, and Student-Faculty Relationships on Facebook. And raises some questions about how does the landscape of Facebook change when faculty and administrators also begin to have Facebook pages or profiles as well. Um, I also wanted to, to mention that, unfortunately, uh, the other event that we'd been advertising in tandem with tonight's panel, uh, Henry Jenkins' public lecture, Art and Storytelling in the Age of Media Convergence, that was hosted by the Oregon Humanities Center, that, unfortunately, has been canceled. And so for those of you who are uh, planning on attending his talk tomorrow night in Lillis Hall, um, unfortunately, he was too ill to have cross-country travel, and they're going to try to reschedule that for the spring. So we apologize that... Uh, that's not going to be taking place. Um, some of you have probably noticed you have some personal response system clickers on your seats. Is there anybody who doesn't have a clicker? Uh, raise your hand and we'll make sure that you are able to, to get one. Everybody has one. Make sure that you have a green light on and if it's not on, push the red button. Uh, that's at the top or I guess the bottom of the clicker. And we're going to be querying the audience tonight on a series of questions and what we're going to be able to do is collect the data and display the results graphically in terms of percentages of how people are answering. And so I want to make sure everybody's able to participate in that. And we'll cue you when we're ready to, to ask those questions. So without further ado, I'm going to turn the panel over to our speakers. OK, um, I'm going to start off. Can you hear me all right? Uh, I'm Andrew Bonamici, as Kevin said, um, Associate University Librarian for Instructional Services. Um, I'm immersed in educational technology all day long. I've been very interested in uh, web services, including uh, Web 2.0 types of services and social networking systems like Facebook uh, for a long time. Um, I've actually had my own Facebook profile for at least three years, so which may be longer than, uh, than some of you. Uh, my son invited me to be um, on Facebook right after the, the U of O got, got started. So um, without any further ado, let's start with a little bit of demographic research using our, our clickers. So let's go ahead and uh, take a look at the screen. How many of you have a MySpace page? And there are three receivers, so feel free to point. And we have uh, about 30 seconds to let them tabulate, is that right? Yeah, we have 30 seconds per question, and these essentially function like a television remote, so mm -hmm. we got to aim at the receivers. We'll 
Okay, so there are the results. Okay, so it looks like about 60% have a MySpace page and 40% of you do not. Um, I would say that's a pretty high utilization of MySpace. Um, all right, let's try our next system. How many of you have a Facebook profile? Seven, six. <laughs> okay. Oh, there we go. <laughs> so you can see on on the typical college campus, Facebook does have quite a bit of activity. Um, this is fairly comparable to uh, national surveys. Uh, usually about 95% of students on a campus like ours have an active Facebook profile. Uh, at North Carolina State University, they found that about 85% of their students had a Facebook profile set up before the first day of class. Um, and after two weeks, they were up to about 95%. So th I would say that's uh, looking fairly, fairly comparable. Okay, so what makes a service like Facebook so compelling, so attractive, um, well, there, there are a lot of things about it. First of all, I think it's something, uh, people are naturally social creatures. And if we have tools at our disposal that are easy to use to help us socialize and make connections with others uh, at whatever level, for better or for worse, uh, we are going to, um, to use those, those tools. Technically speaking, uh, Facebook has, has done a lot of things very well, too. They've made their interface really easy to use, even for non-technical users. You don't have to be much of a web author to you know, set up a Facebook profile and, and start using it actively. I mean, how many of you, just raise your hands, not a clicker question, but how many of you would consider yourselves to be really sophisticated web authors? I'm not talking about navigating websites, but building a website from scratch. How many of you feel like you're fairly competent using your Facebook page? So uh, obviously they've done something right. I mean, you know, if you can drive a car today, you don't have you're not you don't have to be an automotive engineer to drive a car. And I think the uh, the parallel with something like Facebook or you know there are many other systems like it. YouTube is another good example. Really easy to post a video to YouTube. How many of you have a YouTube account? Yeah, a few hands go up. Have you posted videos to them, or do you just sort of look at other people's videos? Yeah, a few. Um, that's, that's the next thing. So uh, they very deliberately uh, planned the Facebook site to use standards. Uh, it's different than MySpace in that regard. Everybody's Facebook profile looks pretty much the same. You know, the content is different. You know, the photos are different. But the interface, the navigation, the, uh, the buttons and tabs along the bottom, for the most part, are all going to be very similar. So any Facebook user can usually find their way around another Facebook friend's page without a big learning curve. So they, uh, they use web standards. They're actually their own set uh, called Facebook standards. They have Facebook uh, uh, application programming um, interface standards or, or APIs. Uh, for all the people who are now developing special applications for Facebook, there's a particular way you do that. If you don't do it that way, you don't develop Facebook applications. That keeps the whole experience very consistent for, um, for the users. So from a web development, a technical perspective, they've done things um, very well. So 93% of you are, are Facebook users. Uh, Campus-wide on the University of Oregon network, as of today, there are 25,474 users. Now, uh, 305 of those are faculty. That number also includes um, a number, of, a large number of undergraduates, gra uh, graduate students, 
uh, staff, uh, alumni. I don't have the exact counts on those. It's a little more labor intensive because it says more than 500. You have to start scrolling through a lot of pages to get the count. But 25,474 users is many more people than we have uh, studying, teaching, or working on the University of Oregon campus. So even factoring in alumni, there are a lot of people. Now I happen to know for a fact that not all of the faculty are real faculty. I mean, I have two friends on Facebook. Um, one of them is named Igor Stravinsky. Anybody know whether or not he's a bona fide faculty member here? Afraid not. Um, how about Anton Bruckner, another composer who's been dead for decades? So it's very easy for, uh, for people to set up a profile for somebody they admire, but isn't necessarily an active faculty member. They gave uh, those, uh, those two composers faculty status at the University of Oregon. They'd probably be glad. <laughs> Worldwide, uh, just to give you a, a little bit of uh, perspective on the size of, of this service, uh, as of yesterday, there were 60 million active users, that's worldwide, of Facebook. Uh, MySpace might be actually bigger, I'm, I'm not really sure. Uh, daily new user average, 250,000. So 250,000 people are adding a new profile every single day. Uh, 65 billion page views per month, uh, 500 million searches per month. Uh, it's the largest photo site in the world. So uh, if any of you use Flickr, for example, to, uh, to upload and store and share photos, um, that's a smaller photo site than Facebook. Uh, there are 1.7 billion photos, which averages out to be 44 photos per user. Uh, it's a massive, massive photo repository. <coughs> um, so we'll, we'll talk about a lot of these other issues through the, through the um, evening, but from an administrator's perspective, what are some of the issues and the questions that come up? Well, who owns Facebook? Uh, it's not a University of Oregon product or service. We have no control of it. Uh, you know, Facebook.com is a uh, publicly traded company. It's, it's a, um, it has partnerships with Microsoft. Um, there are, you know, it's, it's a very, you know, business-oriented uh, site. And uh, they've made a lot of money. Um, but there are privacy issues and questions for students that are, are really worthy of your consideration. How much of yourself do you want to expose to the Facebook community? Um, there are also security issues and sometimes privacy and security issues are closely related. There are also student conduct issues and you've probably heard some of the stories about uh, people rushing the field and tearing down the goalpost um, I can't remember where this was, Penn State or somewhere like that. Yeah. Uh, and then the administrators got onto Facebook the next day to look at all the people who had posted cell phone pictures of themselves and their friends tearing down the goalposts, and then, and then they instituted uh, student conduct uh, proceedings against those students because the evidence was there. Um, so how should uh, universities uh, approach Facebook as a vehicle for service delivery um, and for outreach. Um, librarians are very interested in Facebook. There are very active library communities on Facebook. There are uh, library specialized applications for Facebook that put library services at the fingertips of students who, let's, uh, well, let's find out how often you use Facebook. So um, I think those might be some questions that are, are Late, later on, but that, that, so we'll, we'll get to those. But we know that students use Facebook a lot more than they use the library homepage, for example. It's, it's a fact, we, you know, we can accept that. So are there useful tools that we could put uh, on Facebook and make available to you right from your profiles? Uh, any, anyway, so those are, those are a few starting points, some context about the overall scope of the service how big an enterprise it is, and where it lives, which really is not at the University of Oregon. So uh, why don't we take it from there? Let's see. What, you had a couple other questions. Yeah, what were our next questions? Oh, yeah. I told you my son invited me to Facebook. Um, you know, my son and a lot of his friends are my Facebook friends. 
my daughter and her husband, Facebook friends, uh, my nephew, three of my nephews, my niece, are all my Facebook friends. I mean, I'm a guy who grew up in the 60s when you couldn't trust anybody over 30. We really didn't trust too many people over 25. But it would not have been on my radar screen to uh, privilege my parents um, or their, their generation with access to, you know, uh, sort of private aspects of my life and who my friends were. But for whatever reason, you know, my kids and a lot of their friends and my ne uh, nieces and nephews trust, trust me with that. So it's really, I mean, I'm very honored. It's just kind of strange. So let, let's find out about, uh, about all of you, at least the 93% of you who have Facebook pages. Do your parents have Facebook pages? By parents could be you know guardians, other you know important authority figures, or bill payers in your lives. My mom does not have a Facebook page. She's 80 years old, no, no Facebook page. No. Okay. Aids. So. So A is yes, and B is no. B is no. Um, OK, so you can all invite your, your parents to have Facebook pages if you want to. Um, OK, so for the 15% of you, we can do this quickly. Um, yeah, are you their friend? Yes, indeed, okay, no. so, so uh, about nine percent of you uh, have parents who are friends on your Facebook or MySpace uh, accounts. Uh, Fourteen percent of you um, don't. I mean, your parents have them, but you're not their friend. And then another seventy 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 six percent not applicable. <laughs> Those, that's very interesting. <laughs> I think the rest of the questions were yours, okay. Jeff, so. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right, um, awesome. Um, like Kevin said, I'm Jeff Tan. I'm a student here um, majoring in philosophy, and I'm also an RA. And so I'm going to have three questions to ask. We'll just go through these, and then we'll talk about the, um, the results and whatnot further on um, in the stuff I'm going to talk about. So first off, on an average day, um, how much time do you spend on Facebook? Okay, cool. So it looks like more than half of you spend under 30 minutes a day on Facebook. Okay, cool. That makes me happy. Okay, we'll go to the next question here. Okay, in a single day, how often do you check your Facebook? So this is how many times you pull up Facebook and check your profile.
All right, cool. All righty, so it looks like the majority of you check it four times or more a day. All right, we can go to the next question here. All right, so how many of you have friends on Facebook that you otherwise never speak to? So this is like you added them as a friend on Facebook, but you never talk to them in real life. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, and um, how many of you s would you say that you have ever been a Facebook creeper on somebody, i.e., you really don't talk to them or you don't even know them, but you look through all of their pictures and you read their wall posts and you get an insight into their life, but you don't really know this person? Don't forget your parents. You know those 14% of you who have parents with uh, Facebook profiles? You can creep your parents, too. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Some are curious about others. All right. All right, cool. So I guess I'm going to start then talking about the whole, the social aspect of Facebook, and the perspective I'm going to take on this whole thing is from a student's perspective, talking about the real life ramifications that, um, and implications that Facebook has as a student with your peers, um, from a level socially with friends, from a professional level, um, so pretty much how Facebook does affect your life, that it's not really just a website that you can check, but it actually does have real life implications and real life ramifications. Um, so I'm just kind of talking from a student's perspective on that. So we're going to, drawing back to the question of how many of you have friends on Facebook that you never talk to in real life, and it was an overwhelming majority of you guys do, almost, um, it was 87.5% of you guys do. Now one of the questions I want to pose is if you never talk to them in real life and you never carry on conversations with them with this face-to-face -face communication, what then is the point of adding them as a friend on Facebook? Why would you consider them a friend on an online community, if you want to call it that, and not in real life? Oh. I don't see it as like a actual like friend. You know, it's just like you have a curiosity about this person. Uh -huh. You might see him in the future sometime. Uh -huh. You just want to keep, not necessarily be a friend with them, but I think like adding as a friend on Facebook it shouldn't really necessarily be like a friend. It should just necessarily be like a curiosity sometimes. Uh -huh. Just because you don't, it's not like you really, I don't know. I think, I don't know. I guess that's just what I'm trying to say. Okay. Just curiosity. Um, well, I'm probably in the minority using it like this. Like, I've moved a bunch of times, and it's a really nice network to keep. Um, I mean, I guess I kind of do talk to them sometimes on Facebook, mm -hmm. but I don't really consider it like having conversations with them. <coughs> but it's um, really, I mean, I see that there's obviously negative or ramifications from Facebook, but it's also, for me, it's nice because people that like, live in other countries that I can mm -hmm. never, ever, I mean, it's too much money and work to write a letter. The long distance phone call is out and of country. Yeah, I mean, that's yeah. really ridiculous. So, um, <laughs> I mean, I think it has some good areas in that sense. We'll go one more, then we'll come back to all these questions at the end, too. Uh, so I often find myself in a position where if someone asks me to be their friend, I'll, I'll accept just because I feel bad, quickly reject. And it's, it's like I'm hurting their feelings, I'm gonna hurt their feelings or something if I do it. And then, and, then I'll, and then if you look back at your friends and you're looking through your friends list, there's there's a, a number of people that I don't even know who they are, like I don't remember them. And I'm like, well, I should probably remove them from my friends list, but then I'm worried, well, what if they noticed it? And then they wouldn't like me anymore. 
Exactly. Okay. <laughs> so this brings up a great point now. So with, just with a show of hands, how many of you guys have either requested to be friends with someone that you've never talked to before or have accepted friends that you have no idea who they are, but you just do it anyway? Okay, so good. So it looks like about half of you guys. Okay, so one thing that I do, I'm, I guess I'm really, I'm a big proponent of face-to-face -face communication, like actually talking to somebody, and I feel that Facebook sometimes is coercive to that. So one of the things that I've done to counter that, I think it's actually, for me personally, it's kind of ridiculous to ask someone to be a friend on Facebook and to gain this insight into your life by looking at pictures and contact information and what your other friends are saying to you if you've never even spoken to them before. So one of the things that I do, just as a satire, when somebody requests to be a friend of mine, I wrote this standardized letter that I send to them as a message back, because you can message them back. Um, so before I accept or reject, um, I'll send this message to so say, Zach, you requested to be my friend. Um, I have my profile set to private, so nobody can view my page unless they are one of my friends. Um, so you request to be my friend, and I have no idea who you are. So what I would do is I would message you this message. I would say, Zach, Due to the fact that we have never, never met before, and quite frankly, I have absolutely no idea who you are, I regret to inform you that under Section 4, Subsection 8 of my friend request accepting policy, <laughs> I am unable to process your request to be my friend at this point in time. However, possible suggestions to remedy the situation include, but are not limited to, a face-to-face -face conversation, a phone call, or an introduction of some sort via email, but preferably personal interaction. I'm sorry for the inconvenience. Best regards and warm wishes, Jeff. So I standardized, like, I styled that after like a credit card decline letter. And so it's a complete satire, but even this has real life ramifications. I think I've sent this to five people before, and the response is mixed. Like sometime this one girl said, um, I had no idea who she was, um, and she said, God, I didn't know there were rules for this sort of thing. <laughs> so she kind of took it personally, I guess. Uh, another person who I didn't know who they were, but they knew me, and apparently we had met before in the past, and they knew my sister too. They made some comment, like they said, oh, ha, ha, you really are your sister's brother. We met before at this point and then. And then I remembered them, and so I accepted it. Um, most recently, somebody, I have a, I had a good friend, and she had this guy that was like really, really was into her, right? He was being really persistent in, in wanting to pursue like a relationship with her. The only reason I knew who this guy was was because all over winter break she would tell me how annoyed she was that this guy was so persistent in wanting to date her and she wasn't interested. Never met this guy before, never seen a picture of him, have no idea, but I knew what his first and last name was. So about two weeks ago I get a Facebook friend request saying that this guy had asked me to be my friend on Facebook. And so I sent him this message because there's really no reason why we should be friends if, we've, if I actually have no idea who he is, we've never met before, and it raised the question, you know, obviously he tried to view my page, it rejected him because I have my stuff set to private, so then what are his motives for trying to look at my page? So I sent him this letter, he messaged me back, he says, oh, I'm one of your friend's really good friends, and I know you're one of her really good friends, I thought I would bring it together. P.S. I liked the way that you messaged me. It was very witty. And so I still didn't, you know, decide what to do. Well, I get a phone call from my friend a couple days later, and she just starts complaining to me for 15 minutes. This is literally, I timed this, 15 minutes about how he was offended by that and how he just couldn't understand how her good friends could treat her other good friends this way and that why I couldn't just accept him and, you know, accept his friend request. And so I'm getting an earful from my friend for 15 minutes out of my day about why I didn't accept him as a friend. And she just, she couldn't wrap her head around, why couldn't you just do that? You just have to be, you know, you need to be sensitive. You're, you're unaware that, you know, what you're saying to people, they could take offensive, or whatever. So this, lead, this led to me to several different conclusions and, and things that I pulled out of this. First of all, I told her, I was like, do you realize, I said, just stop a sec, do you realize how ridiculous this is? You've been complaining to me for 15 minutes about Facebook. You know, secondly, you individuals can choose how they wanna use Facebook as a social network utility or how they wanna use that. There's no rule that says you have to accept everybody that requests to be your friend. Especially, like, I have my cell phone number posted on that and everything, and I've got more personal information posted on my Facebook just because I know that the people viewing it are my friends that I'm very selective about adding. So 
there was an example where I had to defuse a situation. My friend was really upset, and I had to take time out of my day to defuse a situation in real life about a Facebook thing that didn't even concern her, that concerned this other guy that I'd never met before. So I think that Facebook then, it, it, it kind of, it's really destructive to this face-to-face this -face communication. And that's why I send that message, and that's why I'm really particular about who I add as a friend. Um, I think it's really important to have conversations with people. And I think that you pull more stuff out of, of other people, and you get to know people better if you're actually talking with them and you're taking the initiative to interact with them. Um, you know, why then was that guy wanting to look at my profile? Did he think that I was competition because I'm one of her good friends and he could see what I posted on her wall but he couldn't see what she was posting on mine? Did he want to look at my pictures to gain insight into my life? Why then is this complete stranger to me who we've never met before so interested at looking at my profile? Which leads me to the creeper question, which was again, 75.6% of you guys said that you have at some point crept someone on Facebook. I was telling one of my other friends um, this story about the, the message, and she, as I'm telling her this, we went to, my friend and this other friend went to, we all went to high school together. And so my friend was able to identify, she knew the guy that I was talking about. She goes, oh, is that the really tall guy? And I was like, yeah. And she's like, oh, is that the one that she, that your friend went to Hawaii with? And I was like, how do you know this stuff? My friend, friend number one, who I was talking to about, let's say her name's Sue. So I'm talking to Sue about the Facebook message thing. Sue was able to know everything that Sally had done, like the friends she was interacting with, the vacations she went with, guys that you know she had dated. She was able to tell me all these specifics. Sue and Sally haven't talked since graduation. They, Sue actually hates Sally. She can't stand her, but they're friends on Facebook and Sue takes time out of her day to go through all of Sally's pictures, and she's able to know more stuff about my good friend that I've known for nine years than she's able to know more than me about my friend just based off of Facebook. So it's like, why then is she, if she doesn't like this person, why does she feel the need to look through her pictures? Why does she feel the need to get this insight into this other person's life if she dislikes the person so much they can't have a conversation with them? So. I think that this whole face-to-face, -face, people hide behind the Facebook, and they want to know people, and they want all the benefits of being able to know somebody for whatever reasons without actually taking the initiative to talk to people. And I think that that's really damaging to communication. And on the larger picture, any of these online mediums like AOL and some Messenger and MySpace and Facebook and online dating services, I think these are really coercive to the face-to-face -face communication because when you're talking with someone, there are these socially acceptable norms that govern your interactions. Like in our culture, it's really inappropriate if I meet someone for the first time and I kiss them on the cheeks. Right? People would be really weirded out. Or I know in a lot of Latin American cultures, when you talk to somebody, you get this close to their face and this real close proximity where in you know, today, like if I were to meet somebody, you have a good distance between you. And these are these socially acceptable norms that govern your interactions. There are certain things that you can do and certain things that you can't do. Online, those norms are stripped and you're pretty much just governed by the rules of AOL and some Messenger or Facebook or MySpace and it's not in real time and you can edit what you want to say and you can say something and there's no real instant consequence with that. And I could be saying something to someone on Facebook, I mean I could have messaged that one guy back and been really nasty to him and there probably would have been no repercussion for that because I'd never seen him before in my life. I mean it'd just be this real pseudo conflict going on. So I think that people hide behind these Facebook things and they just don't want to take the initiative to get to know people. And I think that's really damaging. So next time you're creeping somebody on Facebook or you want to look at somebody's profile and it rejects it because it's private and you request to be their friend, just I challenge you guys to take a step back and ask yourself, why am I doing this? Is this worth my time? What possible utility does this serve in my life to know what they did on their vacation? You know, if you're so interested, call your friend, ask your friend, I'm sure they'd love to tell you about their trip, right? Okay, so there's some more social ramifications. I mean, you had mentioned you're afraid you'd hurt their feelings. I apparently offended this guy with this. I had to, you know, defuse a fight with my friend. It was ridiculous. Also, professionally now, 
So Facebook originally started out where it was only open to college students. You had to have a valid.edu account to create an <laughs> or email to create an account, and that's what it was for. I think last year was the first year that they opened it up to everybody. Community members can have Facebooks. Um, high schoolers can have Facebooks. Pretty much anybody with a valid email can have Facebooks. So what's been going on in Facebook and MySpace too is you have bosses or principals or deans or whoever who are in a supervisor position or authority position using Facebook and MySpace as kind of leverage against people in ways, but if they see it, then there are real life consequences. I mean, people have gotten fired from jobs based off of what they've seen on Facebook. People have gotten rejected from schools or had scholarships pulled because they had excessive partying going on and there were pictures posted there. So there's something to be conscious of is this blurring the line between what you're posting on Facebook and the, it's like your private life and a professional life. And it's kind of a blurred line now that you know, you're posting it on there, yes, you're posting it on there and everybody can see it and you're posting it for the world to see, but are you doing that, you know, are, did you make a Facebook account as a form of self-expression? And if so, I mean, if you're making your profile and you put time into like putting your about me thing and putting quotes that you find interesting, everything like that, if that's a form of self-expression, if you're afraid that somebody would see this and there's going to be serious real life repercussions of them losing a job, losing a scholarship, getting kicked out of school, anything like that, are you then censoring yourself on some kind of level to what you want to say? And then isn't that defeating the whole purpose of the self-expression? So it's kind of, it's this real complicated thing for me that I'm still trying to figure out, it's kind of, you know, I'm, I find myself, you know, censoring opinions like how I say certain things in case that there are things that people say. And I'm not saying that I lead this like complete double life, but, you know, it is it's something to be aware of is that other people in, you know, power positions in that power dynamic will see this stuff. Um, so those are some questions. Um, also, pictures, something I'm just fascinated with. When you post pictures on a profile, are you entering into some kind of contract giving whoever views it consent to take them and redistribute them? I've seen it where I've had pictures of myself, you know, I went up to the zoo with my girlfriend over over Christmas or over um, summer break, and I've seen pictures from that pulled and posted on other people's pages, posted other places where I'm seeing it's like I didn't give consent to these people to take these pictures, and you have to check that you certify the rights to post a picture. But by posting a picture on Facebook, are you then giving somebody else consent to take that and redistribute it? So that's something, too, just that I was just kind of concerned with. And it's just kind of all this stuff. You have to be really careful what you're posting on these profiles because there are real life implications. And is that necessarily a good thing that you're then censoring yourself? I don't know. Those are just some questions and some thoughts I have on Facebook. Um, Jeff, if I could just find employers nationwide. Now, this is on, on the employment issue. Forty percent of employers say they would consider face, the Facebook profile of a potential employee as part of their hiring decision, and several reported rescinding offers after checking out Facebook. So forty percent of employers, pretty high number. Thirty-two percent of students think it's unethical for employers to use Facebook posts as part of an evaluation. 42% of students said it was a violation of privacy. So there, there's a real serious disconnect between what uh, employers might pragmatically grab onto as a source of information or data mining about a prospective employee and what people think um, that form of self-expression should really be, be mm -hmm. used for. Uh, so you raised some really good points. Uh, there, there are definite disconnects between some groups will use this, this information and how you, know, you as the end users might be conceiving of it uh, as it evolves. So, well, that's what I had for Facebook. It's my turn. You know, I have a laptop. I just didn't know I was supposed to bring it. Uh, you can use mine. I mean, I'm not using it for anything. Put it here, more <laughs> tech savvy than I am. Um, it's probably appropriate because I, I'm, I guess I'm going to end up playing the, the role of the, the angry old crank, you know, who, you kids. I, I was telling my uh, 
uh, partner on the way over here that if, that if I could con convincingly do this in, in Grandpa Simpson's voice, I would, you know, <laughs> occasionally blur out Matt Rock or whatever. Um, because I, I have zero experience with Facebook outside the last two days and then only a couple hours, and I guess I'm a, a creep for doing this because I don't have an account. I don't really want an account. So I was just looking at stuff, like whatever I could see. And I use the word partner just, just to start things or some of my worries a little bit uh, rather than girlfriend or boyfriend. Uh, because, for example, my sexual orientation is the sort of thing I don't want to tell people I don't know. You know. It's none of your business. It's none of anybody's business that I don't want to tell. He doesn't ask. He doesn't care. You know, I, or, or how much money I make. This is the sort of thing I could, for people I don't know, have never met, hopefully never will be. You know, like, I, I really, uh, I ended up looking, searching for Washington State University because Pullman's a dump. I don't know anybody that I want to go <laughs> Sorry if you're from there. Um, I didn't want to encounter some of my students on there and know anything about them. It's none of my business. I really don't want to know. You know, it, 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 uh, maybe I'm an inordinately private person, uh, but I, I really wonder what is the, and, and I'd like to ask, at least ask you, that I don't have any uh, mechanism to uh, uh, ask you or have, you know, have, a, have a, a way of you collectively responding, but at least ask you to reflect on why do you want anybody to know? Why do you want to announce in a, in a public way where some creep like me or somebody else, right? Uh, I, literally, I'm not a creep, but I, you know, by your terminology, <laughs> could look it up and go, oh, you know, oh, gay, straight, whatever. What's what's the value to you in, in announcing that if, if they're your and it, this causes me then to worry a little bit about um, and, and because I'm a uh, philosopher I, I, I teach in the philosophy department um, I might suggest we philosophers worry about stuff like friendship and community these are actually ideas that have that have thousands of years of history of serious speculation about what exactly makes a friend a friend in fact uh, in my intro to ethics class next week. I think it's next Tuesday, we're scheduled to spend an hour and a half on Aristotle's conception of friendship. And I could suggest at least that, um, that the Facebook conception of friend doesn't come close. You have this enormous burden for Aristotle's sake in being someone's friend, to take responsibility for them, what kind of person they are, what sort of influence you have over them. Uh, and in a sense, for, for Aristotle, whether they're a good person uh, becomes your, your concern, your responsibility. and in order that you exercise a, a, a healthy exercise, uh, influence over your friends becomes for him the chief reason why you should be a good person. I mean, he takes this extre extremely seriously, and yet listening to the discussion about who your friends are on, on MySpace, um, it, they don't sound like friends to me. They don't sound like people, even the people that I would have my, in my friendship queue or whatever that, that's called. I'm not sure I would want most of them to know how much money I make in a year. I'm not sure most of my friends do, in fact, know that, to be honest. They're polite enough not to ask, and I'm polite enough not to tell them, right? Why would they want to know that? Um, they probably know the sort of bands I like. You know, and, and, and quite honestly, that's, that's, that was the larger impression I got from it, that it was like a modern technology-heavy version of wearing your favorite band's concert t-shirt or <laughs> decorating your high school locker or putting a poster on your wall only it was on a web page of sorts, right? Is this fair? Um, and the comments seem mostly like the inane chatter you hear over one end of a cell phone conversation around campus. Hey, dude, what's up? Nothing, where you at? You know, and kind of just only <laughs> in print. And um, all of that strikes me as largely harmless. You know, uh, when I was in college and I went to the University of Oregon, we didn't have any, we didn't, I didn't even have a computer most of the time. We didn't have email, um, nothing like this. We wasted most of our time, too, you know, doing other stuff, probably similarly idiotic to you. Um, <laughs> but there was a difference, though. There are a couple key differences. One, and thankfully, I won't tell you why, of course, because this is the point, there's no record of any of this stuff. Right? What I did, didn't do, whether what I was wearing or not wearing, you know, what was smoked or not, none of that stuff, <laughs> there's no record of it. It doesn't exist. No one's going to pull it out. No corporation is keeping track of it. There is no, there are no, it's not sti sti statistically accounted for anywhere. No one's marketing to me based on how much beer I drank or when I started drinking and who left my room and what, you know, there's none of that stuff. I don't know about all of you. Do you? You might, you might also ask yourself, there's a lot of money being made off this. Who's making it and how? What, where are they making a buck? You might think, 
Well, I'm not giving them any. They're not making it off me. Are you sure? Where would they be getting it then? They're making it, I presume, by profiling you, tracking what your preferences are. And if you're certain they don't do this, I wouldn't be so certain. If I know for a fact that, like, say, Google Mail, they, they don't read it, but they electronically scan email for references to corporate ownership to, to various things. And they, they compile all this and target people specifically for marketing. So they know if you're interested in rap music or whether you're interested in you know, uh, um, uh, you know, certain kinds of film or, or movies or music or what you do. And then they can target you for more precise, maybe you, you're advertising friendly and think it's just providing you with information you'd like to have. Or maybe you're like me and you think they're much more elaborately and, and with greater sophistication seeking to manipulate me to uh, better, more effectively milk some more, a few more dollars out of me. Um, at any rate, I would almost guarantee you that a lot of this stuff is being kept. This is, this is where the money's going. It, the, and this is an increasing problem of anything on the web. It's being charted, compiled, graphed, associated with a number, if not your name, some of it probably with your name. I mean, I, I could literally see someone's picture, their name, know their birth date, their sexual orientation, how much money they made, how tall they were, who they're dating, who they've dated, uh, what squabbles they might be having with somebody. Right? I don't know what I, I, I'm on, I was honestly left with more with more curiosity as to why does anyone want to do this? Is it just because everyone does it? I mean, 95 percent, right? Have one? Does it? I was wondering if there was anybody here that had neither. Facebook or MySpace literally does not have an on loan <laughs> profile, right? Is it just because if you don't, you're you're a complete loser like me? You know, if I were in your shoes or? I think it depends on who you are, though. Because you keep okay. in contact with people that you wouldn't necessarily keep in contact with. Yeah. Uh, especially, and so like later on, if they're starting something or you're looking for a job, common interest, it's that whole networking business, keep it as wide as you can. Okay. And it continues that acquaintance, not necessarily like friendship, but acquaintance in case you can help each other out or you have common <coughs> interest and would collaborate on something. See, my that was the other worry that there's is that 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 creeps me out a little bit. I confess, <laughs> um, because that's that's in a sense this is what Aristotle would describe as a kind of non-friendship, wherein your interest in the friend, so-called, is in some value to yourself, using them for something, a connection for a job or some in, you know inroad into something you would like, and they're not then a friend in the sense that you don't love them, you don't care about what kind of person they are how they're doing in the richer sense of how they're prospering in life. You're just, they're a contact. And it, it makes human relationships, what should be genuine human relationships based on love and concern, into business relationships, network possibilities, right? And then calling them all friends then doesn't make this distinction. And you lump them all. I mean, just, just to, for, for a simple, weird fact, I, I don't think I've ever asked somebody if I could be their friend. I've never made a friendship request. That strikes me as a very embarrassing thing to do. I've had people ask me to be my friend before, and I kind of, you don't ask that. Uh, um, I don't know, you know? That sort of just happens, doesn't it? At least mm -hmm. worthwhile, you don't like, gee, can I be your friend? Sure. What's that mean? You get, <clears throat> you get to put your picture here and know how much money I make every year or something. What? You know, or who I'm dating or whatnot. Does this make any sense at all, or am I, am I coming off as Grandpa Simpson? Like, dude, you, you know. Because I really wonder, do, do you not care about privacy or see that the, the, a space in your life wherein you can be completely socially unacceptable, um, stupid, I engage in, uh, express opinions you might take back the next day? Um, if you do not see that in the way I think I did and, and, and our culture generally did uh, previously, uh, as a kind of realm of liberty or freedom and, and a necessary one, wherein you can escape social pressures and, and responsibility and, and a need to network with anybody, where you just have friends that are, that are mostly useless to you, except that you, you know. Uh, using the word friends is kind of, a, kind, of, kind of hard. I think I'd call them Facebook friends, because I call a lot of my Facebook friends Facebook friends because they're not really my friends. Um, 
So I think it's uh, really important in this discussion to kind of separate the two. What well, are they then? Why do, you, why, do, why do you want them to have access to? Well, that's what I'm, I'm getting there. Okay. So uh, the, uh, the other thing is um, I kind of use my Facebook like, a, like an address book. So uh, I'm sure some people have address books full of old contacts. Um, and Facebook is kind of like that for me, except I can look at pictures. I can see um, uh, other things that are a little bit more, um, like if I forget who they are, let's say, that I can, I can try and like, get, get my memory back, back around them by looking at their pictures. But the other thing is that if you meet somebody, um, especially when I was before, before I had a girlfriend, if I was um, interested in somebody, I could Facebook them, or if I'm interested in, you know, I just met some, some person, I could, I could Facebook them, and it saved a whole mess of trouble, like a lot of steps in the, in the getting to know you process. <laughs> <laughs> it, was just, like, it was either I have no interest, like, like we don't share any, there's no common ground, like I'll just, I'll just yeah. forget about it, and then we don't have to worry about it anymore. Or if there was some, some like oh same similar bands um, we've been to the same foreign country things like that and make it so the the, the <laughs> that process is a lot easier so it just it comes out to I think it's a lot easier now to to yeah. get to know people and uh, can I ask you are you sure that's a good thing <laughs> is it is it is are you sure it's a bad thing no but <laughs> I, I I worry about it. for example that um, you know I I went on dates in college uh, with people that I was not compatible with and yet I think in odd ways I gained from that or people that I wouldn't have thought I was compatible with that I, I, I you know we proved to get along and learn you know a, a little bit like the, the satellite guidance systems people now have in their car so they don't get lost ever is getting lost always such a terrible thing uh, you find stuff when you're lost that you wouldn't find otherwise you get out of ruts and you you discover new things and maybe you discover new people if you end up out with somebody that if you knew that they liked, you know, uh, um, I, I shoot, I, what's his name? Uh, Michael Bolton, right, or something terrible <laughs> like that. I presume I'm not insulting anyone there, but, right. Uh, that you would think, I couldn't possibly get along with somebody that actually liked Michael Bolton's music or something. Maybe you would, right? You never know. Um, so that maybe that, that, that being able to control things from the start, of course, somebody's controlling, you know, making judgments about you based on fairly superficial stuff, you know, a kind of presentation, a kind of marketing scheme. I mean, this is, a, again, where I worry we're turning ourselves into things to be marketed and advertised and pre presented as a kind of commodity for the consumption of other people. And this, again, seems like a weird perversion of interpersonal relationships that, that, that I, I find really worrisome. And that, that not, that, not that most of what you're doing is harming anybody, including yourselves, but I see it as kind of symptomatic of a movement in our culture that I, I think we, at some point, need to say, you know, no more of this. This has gone too far. We've lost our privacy entirely. We're, we're asked for too much information. You know, you get asked for your phone number and address and social to buy a, a stick of gum now. They, like, what's your phone number? None of your business. Right? It's a, it's a, a shirt. Why do you need to know? Uh, but most people, you, you follow them behind in a store. They're well, three five nine, and they tell them. And I think. They're asking for a reason, and it's not for your good, right? It's for their own profit, and I don't know. Yeah. Um, do you think like the profiles on Facebook, in particular, it's like a really passive form of like the small talk, and so it shuts it down entirely. And I think like yeah, small talk is like kind of boring and awkward, but at the same time, when you talk about those things, you get onto like a deeper level. And if you just like look at someone and be like, oh, that's their favorite band, or like this quote, whatever, you don't get to like talk to them and be like, oh, you really like that person. And You will not see my political preferences, my religion. Uh, their administrators wanted to uh, 
have a new logo for the college. It, you weren't here a few years ago when we sort of shifted from the great seal of the university, uh, mens agitat molum, the Latin motto, the whole thing, to the O. It was extremely controversial, ex especially for the, uh, the faculty. Anyway, um, at Middlebury College, they were doing a similar kind of thing. They were changing the logo that had been there you know, for 200 years. In a matter of hours, they had a Facebook group with 750 or 800 students saying, we don't want that new logo. And the university administration changed their mind. They, when they realized that at this college of 2,000 students, that within hours, 800 of them had made a statement, even on Facebook, as shallow as it is, that they didn't want this logo, they said, eh, um, maybe we really don't want to pursue this. We'll just use it for our capital campaign and then we'll call it good. So, you know, uh, one of the things that happens, you know, and it, it isn't just because it's Facebook, it's because it's on a network. And, and we, don't, we think about the applications and we think about the, the website that we're fiddling around with. We don't necessarily think about the broader implications of that being on a network. There are inherent benefits and there are inherent risks. You know, some of the, the data mining opportunities that it creates, the cost of it uh, necessitates a business model um, that you know, requires advertising revenue to support it. Um, that means they're going to come up with uh, marketing strategies. But the fact that it's on a network can let things happen really fast across large populations. So it can, it can actually be a, a tool for mobilization. Well, there's another thing too. I mean, we've been talking over here a lot about you know, you're marketing yourself and people are using your information, you know, to gain profit. There's a thing called Project Beacon. Have any of you guys heard about that? And there's a show of hands. Mm -hmm. Who's heard about Project Beacon on Facebook? Yeah. Okay, it's the thing where there are like 44 some companies that then when you purchase something from that company, Facebook will transmit your information to them and then it posts on your mini feed that like if I bought a movie from Blockbuster, it would post on a mini feed that I bought this movie. So your information from Facebook is getting transmitted to these companies for purchasing stuff. And it's this real under the table type deal thing and it's really tricky to turn all that off. And there's an article um, on um, it's like GIGAOM.com, um, it says is Facebook a privacy nightmare? And it's just talking about this, um, or Facebook beacon a privacy nightmare. And I mean, do you guys feel comfortable posting, you know, your information on there, having this sent to these companies without your consent? I mean, I know I have a huge problem with that. I mean, Facebook, I mean, Coca-Cola shouldn't know if I buy a Coke what you know my favorite movies are, or who my friends on Facebook are, or what my age is. It's none of their their business, you know, they're getting my dollar fifty for the Coke that I purchased. They should be happy with that. They should need to know my life. They should need to know my personal information. Wait, how does that work? If you buy Coke, you're at a like, vending machine. It says, um, it, it's websites. It says 44 sites have partnered with Facebook include um, everyone from Live Journal, New York Times, Sony Online, Blockbuster, um, Bluefly.com. Is that only if you purchase things through the internet though? Yeah, it says these partner sites put a little piece of Facebook JavaScript on their website um, and certain information cleverly and innocuously labeled as a user alert is sent to Facebook. So it says Fandango users can publish information about the movies they saw. Um, it all seems a clever idea, blah, 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 but it lets Facebook triangulate what you like and you dislike. So it's, it's these websites put this JavaScript application in there where um, you can then publish that stuff, but it's gathering information from you. Um, I'm not exactly sure what exactly it does, but it sends information and then it like posts on your mini feed what you're purchasing online. So it's like it's this tracking system of what your online purchases are. It's well, just bizarre. And as as you might imagine, it's catnip. It's irresistible to marketers because they figure um, people in your well, even though we all know differently that you know there are a lot of Facebook so-called friends that you don't even know. You know, the assumption is that the people uh, who are your friends in Facebook have some common interest. So if, you know, if they can, it's a very, very specific uh, niche marketing opportunity for, for these companies. And as I understand it, I think they've backed off on this program because they yeah. had a huge amount yeah. of uh, criticism um, about it. So they may have backed off a little bit, 
but there are still some, and I can go back and look and um, get word out to the group about the steps for opting out. It's, it's definitely worth opting out in my opinion. I got a request yesterday on the website that said, this website is trying to send the information to Facebook. Would you like to, or can we send that information or do you want to reject it? I'm going to reject it, but it, it is still going on. Yeah. But at the same time, how does that differ from like a Safeway Club card? Um, it doesn't really differ all that much, except the Safeway Club card doesn't really know who who you're connected to, and and that's the that's the power of the Beacon program is that it doesn't only know you um, and and what you've bought in the past, but it's pushing that information out to all of your friends with the assumption that they might be interested in buying some of the same things. So when you you know. Um, and the the, safe, the club cards have had a lot of the same criticism is that they, they really, they can keep track of what you bought. And I'm sure, you know, how many of you have seen the film Minority Report, you know, with, with Tom Cruise? Great movie. I have, I have a blog. One of the things I like to do is a Minority Report technology watch. So when I see things that remind me of Minority Report, I'll post them to my blog. Like in the bins at SeaTac Airport, I noticed Zappo shoe commercials in the bottom of the bins where you put your shoes in the security line. How brilliant is that? Everybody's putting their shoes right on the little shoe footprints. But I'm asking myself, how the heck did Zappo shoes get a contract with either Homeland Security <laughs> or, <laughs> or the uh, Seattle Tacoma Airport? What is with that? How, how can they sell, you know, Homeland Security procedures to advertisers? It really freaked me out. Well, I, I, I looked into it, and indeed, um, you know, it's an airport plan. The airports have to provide those security systems, and they, this is one way they help pay for them. But um, it's, it's similar. You know, there are, there are more and more uh, targeted uh, marketing opportunities. Once it gets on the network, it, it opens up a lot of potential uh, to take that data and do other things with it, manipulate it, push it to, to people who might have a similar profile and so on. Can we go back to the, I think it was your comment, this, this question of, of, of things being done on there. I mean, it, it's one thing for to register an opinion and have some university logo or some other frivolous issue like that. Although I think that, again, it's symptomatic of a, of a troubling direction that the, the U has been eliminated from the university's logo everywhere. And now Oregon State is just OS. Mm -hmm. Like they're trying to obscure the fact this is actually a university and not a football team or whatever the <laughs> O now is, stands principally for. Um, but what else is being, what else, what other productive things are actually going on in there? Any? You know, like with friends, we would, I, I would make a comparison. I do belong to a couple, I'm not a complete Luddite or, or you know, anti technology. I belong to a couple. Belong meaning I have like I can access it and contribute to a couple. I play the bass guitar and there's there are a couple sites that I belong to where I can get tips on new gear, or whatever or technique, or, and whatnot. And I, if I compare that relationship to the people on there to the guys I play in a band with, um, not even in the same realm. I mean, we make music together. We chat anonymously mostly uh, about some gear and stuff. Um, is there anything like what you would do with friends to produce something or get together and engage in some kind of genuinely self-creating, collectively creating what, what communities were, were thought to previously uh, be constituted by, which would be kind of collective shared projects, whereby we'd, we'd collectively create something, say a, a town, or we could build something uh, that we could all recognize as our, a product of our mutual collective efforts that would in turn define us in response, we'd create an identity that way, which initiated from us and our creative activity, insofar as your profiles are largely fit within uh, um, templates, right? They, it's the template which tells you what the essential information is you need, where you put your picture, and all you do is contribute some of these things, create some links to some YouTube videos. These are the things I saw at least. Um, it's all somebody else has created it. You've been told essentially how to arrange it. You get to make some choices. But that seems like a very different thing, and 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 in, uh, giving you only really the the semblance of something like the experience of a community and an identity, uh, and 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 the uh, participation in a culture 
uh, as opposed to a more authentic relationship to a culture that is something you produce as much as you consume. That music would be produced by people and then recognized by people in that community is meaningful to them. And some, whereas if it's made in LA and you buy it online and it's you post your favorites on your page and what did you actually contribute to that other than when say you go grocery shopping and you make a few choices between some major major brands and go I'm an Ajax person not a whatever the other one is Comet is is that really a, an individual if that's what our increasingly our expression gets reduced to is just picking between options supplied by somebody else and within a format that's already been predetermined is there anything actually genuinely creative, productive, producing something new and novel out of the participants in Facebook? Or is it just, I've made a selection of these things, you've made yours, and I guess we can call that our individual expression? You might wonder, is that even expression, or is it some kind of, you know, some something that stands in for that, but isn't really it? Well, they have a tool, you can make events, and that's really like, you use Facebook to get together and so that's like a coordinating device. Yeah, and through that, you can have like a website about the event, and you can put pictures on it, you can talk about the event, but it's not like on Facebook you're actually making anything. Does that happen a lot? Yeah. 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 Uh, event invitation. I was going to say, when I was, a, when I was an undergrad, I actually was really encouraged by my professors um, to be on Facebook. And what they equated it to is it's like your business card for the 21st century. That much like a business card, which has to be two by three or whatever the diameter of a business card is, and it has to be that way or otherwise people won't accept it. It's the same with Facebook. A Facebook is pre-planned, but it's the business card to your life. And much like how companies will go on there to check up on people, they also use it as a tool to find people. Um, for example, I have a lot of friends who work for uh, uh, accounting firms, and they learned information about that accounting firm through Facebook. Um, I mean, they already knew the name of the accounting firm, but they wanted to know what are the people like, what's the atmosphere like, is this the company I want to work for? And they looked on the Facebook and looked at, you know, the company picnic from last summer, and they looked at stuff like that. And it was a way to, it was like a business card or an ad for that company, and the same works for the person, where it's a way, and that can be a social thing, where if I want to meet someone, I can look at their business card and see what kind of person are they, what's their email address, how can I get contact with them in order to get to know them on a personal basis, vice versa. So that was something a professor actually told the class, was you better jump this chasm and get with the times and get on this, um, because you're just going to be a lagger if you don't, if you don't get on it. Can I ask what department that was? See, in yeah. philosophy, resist, lie, <laughs> don't do it. You know, um, we're of course we're trying to get you fired from jobs, not hired for them. So you know, take it for what it's well, worth. I mean, going off that too. I mean, can you really believe though? And at, at what point, like, at what level do you take? I mean, do you take your Facebook at face value? I guess if you want to put it that way. I mean, anybody, since nothing's in real time, I mean, you can really choose what pictures you want to put in there. You can choose what descriptions you want. Going back to what you were saying, you know, when you meet a girl and it takes care of a lot of the, you know, the real awkward getting to know them type deal thing, I mean, that's assuming that they're, ch I mean, they're putting what they really are on there. And so it's like, you can look at people's pictures, you can gain some kind of insight, but I mean, I'm sure that there are issues or pictures and things that they don't want you to see. So at, at what level do you take that act? I mean, I can take the first date, and I can take an interview, too. It's kind of that take it as mm -hmm. only for face value. It's only the initial meeting. It's just like a first date or an interview would be. It's just the surface, and they are putting on an act, and they could be putting on an act. Mm -hmm. So don't take it as more than that. I don't assume, like, if I have a friend, I do <coughs> not take what's on their Facebook to be who they are mm -hmm. from my interaction, which is why, personally, I don't have friends that aren't people I actually have or do interact with. But but yeah, I wouldn't take it more than an interview would be or a first date because I faked you both many a time. Yeah, real quick follow up, and then we want to hear your question. I have a friend who teaches at George Fox in college, um, and and he challenges his students. He work, uses Second Life, which is an uh, immersive environment in his class, and and he challenges his class to think about: Are you the same person when you're in world, you know, in this um, other place? Is your um, what do they call them? Personas or avatars? Yeah. Does that person have the same values as you do in, in real life? And I think it's a it's a very uh, thought provoking thing. How consistent 
are you as an individual wherever you're expressing yourself at whatever depth. So, go ahead. Uh, well, I think also uh, Facebook, like, it's really important to understand how much the times have changed since back in the 60s and stuff, and I was talking to my parents about their college <laughs> <laughs> or 70s, but, but I was like, because I'm, I'm from a city and I'm from out of state, and I didn't, I don't know anyone here, and they were, I come back on winter break, and they're like, well, why don't you have a plethora, or like a plethora of friends already, what's up? And I was like, well, how do you meet people? Because you have your classes, and you know, in a big lecture class, you don't meet anyone. Oh, can I borrow a pencil? We don't have conversations with people. And then there's people in your dorms, and I happen to be in a dorm that's not like me. And then um, it's just kind of like, you know, back in the day, there was like one community telephone, and it was attached to a wall, and you had to meet people. How did you know that? <laughs> <laughs> but it just like, I mean, there's kind of this, this huge social pressure and through Facebook, you know, you someone requests a friend on Facebook and they're from like the first floor in your hall and you've never talked to them before, so <coughs> you request you on Facebook and you're like, oh hey, you know, and it's like an initial um, kind of meeting that otherwise just doesn't happen, and like especially in the city, so I'm not, I'm not quite done, especially like in the city I know, it's like, it's even harder because they don't, there's not even like small communities of, you know, there's just like community in general I think is really disintegrating in especially in American culture, and I mean, Facebook is not helping that by any means, but it's also kind of just advice for people to make, make a social network of some sort. Okay, I, I can respond real quick. Um, Going off of that too, it's like you know making friends in lecture. I mean, what would happen if tomorrow when you sit in lecture, the person sitting next to you just says, "Hey, how you doing? How's your day going?" And you start a conversation, and then you introduce yourself. Oh, well, hi, I'm whoever. Like I'd say, "Hi, I'm Jeff. How you doing today? What do you think of the reading?" Et cetera, et cetera. Like, what if you took that initiative to just talk to that person? I mean, I know that most of my friends here, like when I came down here, I'm from Salem, so I'm so, so from in state. But when I came down here, there are people from my high school that came down to U of O. I really didn't want anything to do with them. I was <laughs> like, no, I'll be go to somewhere else if I'm paying $6,000 a year to turn this into U of O high. You know, I don't have to pay to be with those people anymore. And so I really wanted to meet new people. And, you know, you do that just by introducing yourselves to people and having conversations. I mean, I met my last girlfriend because we were in the same discussion session and we were walking out the door at the same time and I asked her about the paper that we wrote. And then from there, a 10 month long relationship started. And it's just like, you know, it's that face to face communication, it's taking the initiative. And I think a lot of people are scared to like talk. And, and as we get increases of technology, that willingness to interact with people on a personal level is getting smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. So I mean, what if tomorrow you did, you just talk to somebody and maybe they could be one of your really good friends down the road just by introducing yourself. Definitely, I'm just pointing out that, I mean, that there's a phenomenon going on here that, I mean, I'm not saying, I'm not defending Facebook. Oh, I know, and I'm not accusing you. <laughs> okay, I'm just saying yeah. that it's a, something to look at, and it's also a, kind of along the same lines. Actually, never mind, I don't want to go there. Well, um, <laughs> it isn't just Facebook. It isn't just the internet. It's, we go everywhere in automobiles. You know, um, we do. Uh, you know, we do a lot of things in isolation. You know, as, as Stephen was pointing out, um, a lot of our music isn't music that we make. You know, it used to be most homes had pianos. People sat around the piano. That was the only form of music they had. They they bought sheet music. They subscribed to sheet music services and they played it in, in their homes. You know, because that was the only way they were going to hear anything. You know, so times have definitely changed. And a lot of these uh, technologies do enable us to, to isolate ourselves more. So we, we have to be aware of it. At the same time, they can enable us to connect. And, and I, was, um, I was thinking about, as we were talking about, um, you know, whether it's you know, you know, people that you, you, you love and you really care about. I have some really, really close friends that I truly love and care about um, who work on the East Coast. And we don't talk a lot except at conferences, but we're in touch a lot um, through uh, 
you know, through Facebook, but also through commenting on one another's blogs. And, you know, we're, you know, it's like a tribe of people who do the same kind of work that I do. And, and we're, we have to do that, but we're far flung. So we, we have to use the, the tools that are at our disposal to, uh, to keep up the relationships. Somebody has yeah, you had your hand up over there for a really yeah. long time. So. Um, about the sheet music, uh, I, I'm trying to keep track of my, all my, I keep building on what I'm trying to say, but uh, <laughs> the sheet music example, um, you can argue, are they creating the sheet music music though? I mean, they're still subscribing, they're still getting that music, they're still playing. Yeah, somebody, somebody else has music. proposed it and somebody's yeah. published it and they've marketed it to you know the buyers. So I mean, you could say yeah. that. You can also say uh, the question about are we, um, are we marketing, like, we're marketing ourselves with our Facebooks, but are we also marketing ourselves to clothes we wear? Uh, are we also marketing ourselves with, uh, uh, in casual conversation, I'll say, I listen to this band, isn't that marketing? Um, you, you, you're arguing that, uh, um, well, uh, there's way too much. Um, uh, well, let me ask you, if, if you're playing from sheet music, you still have to learn how to play a piano. Part, part of the, the initial mm -hmm. comments uh, about, um, the, the reason why it's so many people are participating because it requires no skill at all. Mastery of no technique, you don't have to know anything about web programming. And you might think, well, great, I don't need to learn something. But then you didn't have to learn anything. And that, that goes both ways, right? And the more our lives become sort of provided for us such that we master nothing, we acquire no new skills, no new expertise, no, per also limit the, the ways in which we might actually work on ourselves and, and produce something of ourselves and not merely just rely on somebody else to supply us with the, the, the means to engage in expression, which is, I like that band and that band, and they were all focus grouped to death so they know they'd sell to the most number of people and produced by the, the one guy that knows how to make it sound just the right way. And, you know, I, I mean, I can't, it, Maybe a university logo could happen, but I can't imagine a new movement in music or much less a social revolution occurring over or via or through Facebook. Can you? I mean, is there any? Or, or even uh, if I, I'd wonder if from the earlier thing, just which I don't know if these are totally disconnected, how many of you have had Facebook friends become real and genuine friends? And you don't need Aristotle to, to know what that is. I assume you know what those are. And, and I, hopefully you have them. How often does that even occur? Much less that you meaningful social movements or innovation occurs through it. That seems even more remote, but along for the same reasons. And I don't know if that makes sense. But I don't know if I want to see call be in the position of calling well, people. Um, I think you're making the assumption that uh, there's no human interaction that happens with Facebook. Um, and I want to say that that Facebook is kind of like I don't want to say it's like a first date. Or like an interview, I want to say it's like the pre-interview or like the pre-first date or the pre like it's just it's information and it's not necessarily a community. It's just like I said, it's like an address book. So uh, you can still use that as a, as a means of getting together. Like there was a Facebook message that came out that said we're having this meeting here tonight and look at the community that came here to do this. So we're having we're creating something. We're having a human interaction right now that came out of the Facebook. So so Facebook is not is not the community. Facebook is the tool. Um, and how you use that tool is is really, I mean, you can argue either way. Um, me using the tool in this way to, to network, to come together, and to, to make a community out of human interaction rather than making the Facebook the interaction. Well, your tools define what you do, too. You say, here's your selection of tools, and here's the, here are these real easy ones that you don't need to know anything. It's going to be real tempting to just use those tools and do what you can do with those tools, when there may be other things you could do if you were willing to try to use tools that required some effort and some expertise and some ability and maybe creating your own tools. Does that make any sense? I mean, I, I understand what you're saying. Of course, it's right. But there, there's another side to that, too, that insofar as you make things really easy and simple, it's, it's really tempting for people to take the easy way out and go that way rather than venture out and introduce yourself to people in class, meet them through this virtual medium, Right, and take the kind of easy way, which may probably doesn't usually lead to genuine human interaction. I I, I don't know if it's if it's stark either way, but I I, I hear what you're saying. Yeah. It starts okay. with human interaction and it goes to Facebook. It's like I'll meet somebody and then I'll Facebook them. I won't Facebook them to meet somebody. So you meet somebody, you go back to the pre-interview? No, it's just well after I meet somebody, I find out what their interests are. Like it's, uh, it's, a way of, it's a it's like uh, doing your research. What's 
Yeah, okay, so um, I was kind of going to say something along the lines of what um, Mike said, uh, as far as like it's it's a tool, I think, um, to, to kind of like to keep up friendships. Like I moved from the East Coast right before high school, and I found people on Facebook that I would never <coughs> otherwise probably see again. And I've gotten to check in with them and say, hey, how are you doing? How's your life? You know, and, and otherwise, I would never get to see them again. You know, I would never um, have any interaction. And then if I go back to the East Coast, that, that Facebook connection leads to, like, I, I went over the summer and, um, you know, I messaged them and said, hey, I'm going to be in town. You know, I'd like to see you. And otherwise, without that, I wouldn't have seen them. So um, I, guess, I guess one point is that, you know, it's not, although, like, I do have problems with, you know, Facebook or, you know, how everybody walks down the street with their iPods and nobody smiles at each other or says, hey, anymore. I mean, or on their cell phones, yeah, I mean, not, not never, but um, it's definitely kind of problematic. But I guess my question is kind of, um, where's, where's the healthy media? You know, like, I don't think we should just abol abolish Facebook. I mean, just like I shouldn't abolish laptops because we have typewriters, you know, like, you wouldn't use a typewriter if you have a laptop, or you wouldn't use like a hand egg beater if you have, uh, you know, an electronic. <laughs> uh, so, anyways, like, what, what's, what's your, what's your solution to that? Like, you can't just smash Facebook and then. Oh, yeah, I, I'm just, I'm that. just trying to get you to because you're all doing it just to try to get you to, this is what philosophers do, this is what I do in my philosophy <laughs> classes, try to, to, to complicate things, provoke you to think about them further, recognize there may be another side, you may be missing out on things, maybe it's easy and that's not always good, um, maybe um, you're putting stuff on there that if you wouldn't tell somebody face to face, maybe you really don't want on there, um, maybe you can examine why do I want to put some details of my private life up on, on the, the web. Um, and maybe you won't like the answers and you'll change your mind. I don't know. But if, if just to try to provoke you to think about it, I, I don't have any answers per se. I, you know, I, I, I've, honestly, I, I came here mostly wondering, I don't know what this is all about. And <laughs> here's, some, here's ways that, that I worry about it. But maybe it's uninformed. But Well, I want to say a quick word about the tools. And I, I think it's an interesting analogy that the tools that you, I mean, the stuff that you make, uh, you build with the tools that you have at your disposal. But um, 60 million people want to, want to do something with a tool that's called Facebook. So if every one of those people had to build, I mean, if, if what you want to do is communicate with people and build a social network and have these chat services and post photos and do it all from one place, um, that's a very complicated set of, of exercises. Um, and probably nobody would be able to do it, but it's obviously something that people want. You know, so, um, yeah, so would you all like sit down and try to build something like this from scratch if it weren't there, or would you be doing something else? How much of a priority is it to engage in, in these kinds of activities online? It's a really uh, out there kind of hypothetical question, but I, I think it is, I mean, the, uh, the demographic, the, the penetration of Facebook into the population kind of speaks for itself. It is something that people really like. They have a very engaging um, product that, that has gotten a huge amount of traction in only three or four years. Anyway, we've got a few more hands. I think the question was. Well, I was just going to say, something I think is really interesting about Facebook is, and other social networking sites is um, the ability to use that as an um, I have somebody who's close to me who has a physical disability, and she likes to use the social networking sites to meet people first because she feels like people prejudge her in real life. And so when she's interacting with people, they see her and they put her in this box and they are interacting with her based on that rather than getting to know who she is. So, when, and so you know, in my inclination is, oh my gosh, you can't just meet people online first. It's not safe and there's weirdos and they're going to get you and that kind of thing. But she's like, well, I feel like I'm making genuine friends this way, and I get a chance to, they get past those barriers with me, they get to know me first, and then when they meet me in their life, they already kind of know who I am and have had a chance to interact with them without them seeing that part of me. 
that's a, a really important point. And uh, a lot of faculty who teach online will tell you that they will start to hear from students that never speak up in class. They'll, they'll get, start to get amazing uh, commentary on, on the readings and feedback from students that they would ne they've never heard from before because there's a different context or a different venue or framework for them to express themselves that they, they don't have in the, um, in the live classroom for reasons, whatever reasons, intim intimidation, shyness, might just take them a little longer to put their thoughts together. I don't know if they would ever be able to find it again from that particular Facebook site, but if they have downloaded it previously, um, it wouldn't really go away. Um, you know, once once things uh, get out there in in the network land, uh, they will. You know, people grab them on their own computers. They get mirrored on other sites. It's very very difficult to completely eradicate. Um, a fact or an image or a, a site um, that you don't want to have there once it's there. So it's a, it's a really important thing to keep in mind. Mm -hmm. uh, so Mary, if you have, I don't, maybe you guys don't have the answer to this, but if you have your profile set up private and you're pretty um, careful about who you have as friends and stuff, does that, is that uh, hiding information? I mean, if it's, all they can see is really like what school you go to. So can just companies doing a search, like say a job search, they can't? They can't access, like as far as I know, like for me, um, unless I personally accept as a friend, if somebody looked up Jeff Tan, they'd search through a lot of Jeff Tans, but when they eventually get to my picture, it'll just have my profile picture, and I'll say message me, um, request as a friend, et cetera, but you can't actually access that. If you want to go even further, so say there's somebody that you really don't even want it to know you exist on Facebook, you can find their profile and you can block that person. And then you're invisible 100% to them. They can't, like if they look at somebody else's wall and you've posted on that wall, they don't see your comments because you're blocked, you block them and you're invisible to that profile. But that's a specific, you have to find somebody, you have to specifically add them to a block list. But there are measures you can take that it could be blocked. Of who's watching, exactly, mm -hmm. exactly. Could they sign up under a fake name and they could and not be blocked? And what do you, does anybody know what Facebook does with like if you delete a picture, is it gone from Facebook's mainframe wherever it was to begin with, or do they just remove it from <clears> that page? But what do they do? Your information is private to I don't really know. I'm, people I'm looking, kind of, but what does I'm the company kind of, do with I'm it? I'm kind of guessing that. Um, they, it's probably still there somewhere, like on backup servers or, or in indexed uh, log files. Uh, but it wouldn't it wouldn't be public again. You have a knowledgeable mind. Okay, so I know that like if I put an album up of like a party I went to last weekend and take you know pictures of my friends, and then they get tagged in by me or by somebody else. Like say my my friend Sam is tagged in a picture, and then he untags himself. The picture is still in the album that I put up there, so my friends can still see the pictures that I put up of Sam. But Sam's friends, if they go to Sam's site, can't find the picture that I tagged him in because he untagged himself. Um, there is that the button that says um, uh, it's like inappropriate report. When, yeah, report this image. Um, and I've had friends do that where they report the image and then Facebook clears the image from the album. And I don't know if Facebook keeps a record of it or something, but I know that just untagging yourself doesn't delete the image. It just makes it harder to find it. Well, one more question, then I think we've reached the end of our. Uh, this is a slight change, like a little change on the topic. Uh, you had addressed how you couldn't see like any social movement or anything gathered from Facebook. But I've noticed, especially with the uh, upcoming election, that Facebook has been a very prevalent factor in uh, 
candidacy that like in uh, TV polls and such, you'll see certain front runners, but then in the online world, in MySpace and Facebook alike, you'll see a whole another set of trends that could significantly change the outlook of political culture. I'm not sure I'm following. You mean that there are polls done among Facebook owners yeah, or users or whatever that, that suggest other? Well, and there are, there are support groups for candidates, uh, fund fundraising uh, for candidates. Uh, it, it happens very rapidly with very, very large uh, numbers of people. Of course, mostly political campaigns are marketing campaigns now. They're selling you Coke or Bob Dole or whoever, right? Yeah. I don't know. Or I don't even know who's winning. You know, I, I do, actually, whoever they are. Um, I vote for Dennis Kucinich and people like that. So, you know, I, I'm clearly not their target for the market. Well, before we conclude, just if you could join me in, in thanking our panel.